I'm Dr. Judy Ann Calloway. I'm the Associate Dean for Admissions and Outreach here at the Long School of Medicine, UT Health Science Center, uh, San Antonio, and I'm delighted to be here with you today to answer some questions. Awesome. So for students who are applying to medical school, I wanted to kind of break it up in pre-application, the application cycle, and maybe post-application. Mm -hmm. um, what should students know about when they're getting ready to apply to medical school, they haven't put the application in yet, mm -hmm. what should students know to be successful? Mm -hmm. What kind of tips would you give? So, uh, in a very broad way, we can do some uh, overall things and, and get specific if you like, but overall, I would start right now to make a plan. I think the people who are most successful are very organized, they are learning from um, information like yours, Dr. Weber, mm -hmm. and from other sites and sources, they're learning what's needed. But if you really get organized um, about it and disciplined about filling in any gaps way ahead of time, you know, as it comes closer and closer, you need to know everything that's in that application and put down everything you can think of that might be pertinent to um, filling out a robust application. Okay, so when students are applying to medical school, um, is it on a roll-in admission and students should get their application in on the first day that the application opens up? Is that advantageous to get your application in as soon as possible? Um, yes, it's very, it's a good question. Um, when we look at the timing and when people submit their applications, last cycle for the entry year of 2017, the students who started school, uh, medical school in 2017, May, if you submitted your application in May, June, or July, this is just to the, I can't speak for the AMCAS system, but just for the TMDSAS system, May, June, and July, that comprised 75% of the applicant pool. This year, uh, the students who are going to start in a, in a month or so, um, it was the applications submitted in May and June filled the interview slots 75 percent mm. May and June mm. so when we say apply early apply early apply early um, people are listening mm. to that it really is advantage advantageous for people who you know might have sort of average or even below average sorts of numbers and things we're we're inundated with applications from the very beginning but um, I guess the cycle is newer and fresher. I think it works to people's benefit to get something in early. That being said, um, if you've got a wonderful application, we're, we're looking for people all along the way, you know, okay. at our school. Okay. We, we keep that process going the whole way. And how many schools should a student apply to? And it's probably variable, depends on where they want to end up, mm -hmm. but what's a good number of schools a student should apply to? I think that the Texas system makes it easy. There's not anything like it across the country. People tend to apply geographically anyway, so the um, Texas Medical and Dental School Application Service makes it easy, and you can apply to all those 10 schools at once with uh, a fee that covers everything. Um, so that's sort of, that's an easy decision. When we see people who, um, have applied to just a selection of those, I think you should have a process. So sometimes people want a big city, um, maybe thinking that the, that setting will offer them um, a rich variety of patients to learn from and help. Um, other people choose smaller schools, you know, so if there's, there's not a right number of schools unless your application is a little bit uh, lacking in one reason one way or another um, if your metrics for example are sort of on the average you want to have a bigger it's just like residency yeah. too you probably mm -hmm. tell them this already um, so applying broadly gotcha. if you can and you have so many students that apply to your medical school yes and then you only take how many students per year we take 220, 220 here at long how do you pick out from all those students <laughs> out there what, how do you pick out one student for original? What makes the student stand out? Yes. In your eyes. Okay, so that, that's, it's so hard because we get the opportunity to talk in person to about a thousand. So we interview about a thousand students. And the vast majority of those thousand students are wonderful. So the people who really um, stand out for us are people who've made 
a pretty substantial commitment. Like um, maybe they're a big brother, big sister. So under the topic of community service, they really have hearts of service. They want to serve and they've done something long term. We like to see in an application a little variety and things like that, but those would be, that would be something that stands out. Also things that people have done to improve themselves. I call it the personal growth plan. They have really, for example, not been a reader, but they've made, they've realized the importance of reading and they've become a reader. Um, they have taken their hobby to a new level. Say they were already a, a reader. Um, now they're logging their books, logging what they've learned from, um, from books also under this personal growth plan. And this would sometimes be recorded uh, in a few areas on that personal biography, but for example, under leisure time, extracurricular and leisure time. It's not just, don't just put the clubs that you've belonged to, put what you've done to improve yourself. Learning Spanish, that would be a great thing to put under there. Um, if you've been disciplined for a long period of time and every Saturday you take 30 minutes to look at two free apps on your phone and learn medical Spanish, that would be something that would stand out for us, teaching teaching yourself something. Gotcha. Uh, MCAT score. Yes. Uh, yes. What do you have to tell students yes. about MCAT score? I have students who also who say that they may have a low MCAT score. Can they do anything else to compensate for that? So l let me say something that um, you know I want to I want to land on a positive note here, but there is a myth, mm -hmm. and I put this on the, my podcast with TMDSAS when Mr. Hasso asked. Um, what myths are out there that need to be busted. So there is a myth out there <clears throat> that um, if you have a low MCAT score, it's going to be okay because your personal attributes are fantastic and your experiences are rich. Um, and that's a little bit of a myth. When we talk about a holistic review, really the metrics and that your wonderful personal attributes and your wonderful experiences are looked at in a balanced way. So you really need to show that you have academic strength. It's a three-legged stool. And if one of those legs is, a, is skinny and weak and it's a toothpick, and the other two legs of the stool are strong, that stool still is not gonna stand up. So um, we need to make sure for everyone, not just for the school, but especially for a student, that they can make it. So we want to see some academic strength, some rigor in the coursework. You could be a history major, you could be an English major, you don't need to be a science major, but it has to be, you have to practice rigor because we all know that medical school is very rigorous. So in terms of the MCAT, we don't have cutoffs. Many schools will have cutoffs. I would suggest that applicants and pre-meds look at averages that are happening. I would suggest that you have a great plan of action to attack that MCAT with um, and be proactive about it. The AAMC realizes that it's people don't have $3,000 to throw at a prep course. So they have endorsed Khan Academy, which is free resources and very good resources. Um, you have to be, so plan out your study. Take, um, I would uh, make sure that practice tests are included in that study plan. And don't look at the number, don't look at the score you're getting, because I'm going to tell you to deduct five points at least. You know, if you feel solid, you're making the state average of a 510 um, in your practice test, I would tell you, okay, well, just if you're going to think of a number, subtract five points, and that's where you're going to be. So practice, 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 but make sure every test is giving you a point or two more, a point or two more. Make sure you're making progress with that. Okay. And students who don't get in the first time or second time, re-applicants, mm -hmm. how do you feel about those and what can students do to improve on their application or right. what are your thoughts on re-applicants? So I would make sure that, uh, so first of all, um, there I talk about um, the getting hit by the numbers um, and sometimes it's grades or MCAT and you need to um, uh, do some repair there. Mm -hmm. It could be sheer, it could be the, the time and date. Maybe your um, 
application was just submitted a little bit late, right? And then third um, is you could be caught up just in the sheer volume. Our school receives more than 5,000 applications, more than any school in the state because I think people realize it's great quality in this great atmosphere. Um, anyway, lots of schools are dealing with uh, just high numbers. So people are great applicants. They're going to be great physicians. I would say stick with it, you know, um, and look and see, you know, this is part of a critical self-assessment. You need to be able to say, I understand what l appears to be lacking. Our school does uh, in the spring, late spring, March, April, well, is that late? Anyway, in March or April, we start helping people and do a lot of application reviews for people awesome. and some workshops and things, so watch for that in the spring. Okay. Post-bag programs or graduate programs yes. if your GPA is low, that's yes. a good thing. Okay. Perfect for grade repair. Okay. I, I see a lot of, in terms of myths or things, uh, I do see people getting a master's degree mm -hmm. to help their GPA, but really a degree in a hard science so the medical masters where a lot of the courses are the same as a medical school curriculum and you're taking them with the medical students, that is great. Other things that are very important, epidemiology, public health kinds of things are excellent, but if you're doing it for great, if you're doing it as a, a, a gap year or year of experience, that's wonderful. If you're doing it for grade repair, it has to be rigorous science to show people, look, I can do this. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. three last myths. Sure. Uh, students that are worried about they're too old to apply to medical school? Oh yes, okay. So no, 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 stop thinking about that. Um, actually, I went to medical school when I was 30 and um, had a whole other career first as a teacher for uh, nearly 10 years. And before I decided I wanted to help people, uh, help kids through medicine. So it's never too late. I have to say age, you cannot discriminate on the basis of age. We talk about, in committee meetings, we do talk about age in terms of experience, maturity, those kinds of things. So if, so um, uh, not so great thing would be to bounce from career to career and finally you've decided you're like bouncing on medicine. If your path makes sense and you can explain how you got here, you were doing something and needed a, a, a more human connection, you wanted to help people through science and you just weren't getting it through your experiences in research or business or things like that, that makes sense. So we have a wide range of applicants who make it into medical schools every year. What's the oldest applicant that you uh, Oh, in, in, in the 40s, 40s. Okay. Uh -huh, recently, you know? Okay. So, and in, in terms of our whole class, the last few years I've looked at the statistics, almost half the class has been out at least one year. And we have had probably in the class 10 to 15 or 20 who are several years out. Um, this year so far in our class, we don't have any final numbers, but we have somebody who's out, been out for 12 or 13 years. Oh. Yeah. Uh, one last myth, mm -hmm. uh, you have to major in biology or chemistry to go to medical school. Yeah, big myth, yeah. big myth. We have, and I love to see somebody who has, uh, they know they have a gift for voice, so they were a music major. They knew they wanted to be a doctor, but they've got a gift, and this is their last chance to, you know, study that academically while showing and learning uh, science and showing strength in the science. So English, history, um, the other sciences, study the sky or, or art, you know, uh, just make sure you're building your, your science. All right. Any resources okay. students can they can use to when they're applying to medical school or through an application cycle? Yes. Um, so I don't know if this is exactly what you mean, but I would absolutely use your resources, Dr. Weber. Mm -hmm. I would go to our website. We can offer some things also, and we have various things. Uh, we have. I'll put a plug in for our monthly webcasts. Mm -hmm. We have web chats rather every month on the on the fourth Thursday every month at the noon hour Central Standard Time, and people can look on our Long School of Medicine Admissions website to see what the topic of the month is. 
we do question and answer after a little presentation. The TMDSAS website is no longer just the application service. They've got all kinds of things, Facebook, um, podcasts, and things to learn about, and the AAMC. So those are the big ones, I think. And just reach out, and when you find a great resource, share it with everybody so that awesome. we can all learn. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you for uh, having me. No problem.